Post this in her own record first. Record update. Goes back to the main menu. Remove sure enough. Stored raw site scripting. All right. Now, this is really interesting. Now that she knows that she can actually store scripts in people's records, she can figure out that if she can only store the script in Jennifer's record, she can get just about anything. We call the clients of that. All kinds of stuff. But the problem is that Donna is not at the level in the organization. I mean, yeah, Susan's not at the level in the organization where she can uh, update those particular records. And she thinks about this and she's done some searches on Google and she finds that a popular technique for getting these sorts of scripts loaded in other people's records is to go ahead and send them an email with a uh, malicious attachment. And when the person clicks on that attachment, it wants a script that can then you know, stick this stuff into their, their database, taking advantage of this cross-site scripting vulnerability. But in this particular case, she also knows that Jennifer runs their uh, computer security awareness program and therefore is not likely to be somebody who's going to be clicking on uh, links and email messages. And in fact, if she did that, would probably report her and get her in trouble. But there is another employee that she knows who is not quite so conscientious. And in fact, she has noticed a couple of times walking by her computer during the day, or her computer during the day, she sees that this way is even still playing uh, Farmville. I think it's Farmville 2 now is actually out there. So she's big in the And talking with her a little bit, finds out that she is also very enamored of puppies. She's got pictures of puppies on her desk. She's got those little um, you know, puppy coffee mugs and things of that sort. And taking that bit of social engineering she waits until the puppy person logs into the application and also goes to check her personal email. And she's going to send her this email with the picture of the cute puppy and they're telling her to click on this link to see the cute puppy. Now this is going to take advantage of a web vulnerability called cross-site request forgery. I'm not going to go into the details of how we create cross-site request forgery uh, scripts here, but I'll say that Susan did it the same way I did it, which was I just downloaded a tool from the internet, hit the button, and it generated one for me. It's, it, it's that easy. Again, again this, is, this is not cutting edge check and stuff. So Donna comes down here. She clicks on the attachment, and sure enough, the cutest puppy you've ever seen, you know, pops up there. For the purposes of this demo, I just have that set up as a static link to this particular picture from that, uh, from that mail page. In real life, in an actual email application, you would have almost certainly gotten a warning telling you, are you sure you want to view this attachment? It might contain malicious threat or, or whatever it is that these error messages are saying these days. And of course, she would have just clicked yes because that's what our users do, and partially because that's what we have trained our users to do. Because anytime they've got to run the job or plug in or anything of that nature, we tell them just go ahead and hit yes because that's the only way you're going to get the thing to work. The script will have run, it will have generated a transaction using that carrier ID information that she got earlier, 46 to 48, to insert the script using the cross-site scripting vulnerability into Jennifer's record, even though this is done and logged in, and the damage is done. And really, that's, uh, that's all we need uh, to dump for. I mean, all she had to do was just click on that link in the email. She was a completely unwitting accomplice. So, 
What happens next? Well, Susan goes back to her computer and she starts a beef. Now, beef is uh, another one of these things that's easily downloadable in the browser exploitation framework. Uh, we're not going to go into how it works. You, you don't need to know how it works. You just download the thing, you crank it up, and it runs. It even gives you the sample script that you need to put into your attachment that you send to the other person for them to click on. You use, you cut, you paste it, you put it in there. You don't have to be any sort of elite hacker to get to pull this thing off. Then you start it up and you wait. In this case, we wait for Jennifer to log into the application. When she does, that record gets called up. That pulls the script that was stored in her record via Donna's uh, puppy attachment. And sure enough, over here on Susan's computer, her computer shows up as a hooked zombie. And her Jennifer's browser will start sending information back over to Susan's computer. Well, the first thing it sends over here are you know, a bunch of stuff like the Internet Explorer version, a, you know, all this kind of stuff is, is running. So one of the first things that we want to check for that Susan has learned by doing some more Google searching that makes things easy. Now, those of you who have seen me or can read it here on the screen, I mean, you, you can see there's a bunch of stuff in there I think that is exploiting you know, all this complicated stuff. But Susan, I mean, she, she doesn't know how to run that editor, we don't, we don't expect her to. So she just follows the step-by-step -step approach that she got off the internet, which says, okay, the first thing you want to do is check down here to see if the other person's browser is set up to uh, allow unsafe active X. So you just click, hit execute, you wait a moment, it'll go, it will run silently on the other person's computer, they won't even, they won't even see anything. And you'll get this message back that says, browser is configured for unsafe active X. Now why is this? Now those of you in this room who might be programmers, it's probably, it could easily have been over 10 years since you did anything with Microsoft Com code, but so many things out there in the you know, corporate world are still running that would break if they suddenly turned this off on everybody's browser. So you would be amazed at how many companies out there still have this set as the default in their browser. And this was the case in the company I was working at, or working for for it at this particular time. Sure enough, all their browsers were configured for unsafe at ActiveX. All right, so now Susan goes on to step two. There's a whole host of things that we can run here. Uh, for example, we can come in here, uh, we can pick uh, the get registry keys from Beef. Now, we click on that execute button, that will send some commands over to the browser, and the browser will go down. Jennifer's computer, and after a few moments, if we've made the proper sacrifice to the demo god, sure enough, up come you know, whatever register piece that uh, well, Jennifer's ID would have had access to, whatever you know, uh, register piece you want to pick up. For Susan, she really doesn't know too much about register keys, so that, that's not going to do her too much, too much good. Uh, another one I'm just going to show because it's one of my favorites. She could have just mentioned it in passing to Jennifer that she had heard about the new uh, security enhancement that's been made to the application here recently, whereby if you're inactive for a certain period of time, you, know, you, you could be, be timed out and it's just a, you know, a, a, a protection. And I'll mention the more here at the beef. She'll run this. What will happen over on Jennifer's computer here in a moment? Jennifer will be working, and then all of a sudden she'll see that oh, she gets this message session time out. The session is not out an activity. Enter username and password to log in. Okay. She 
types that in, Jennifer clicks on sign in, and wow, it appears to be working just as it's supposed to. It certainly is working just as Susan wants it to, because when she comes back over here, now she's got a copy of what it is that Jennifer just typed in. Another handy thing that could be done would be to go into Beef and request the uh, page HTML. Now what this is going to do is exactly what it, what it sounds like. This is going to give you a copy of the HTML of the page that Jennifer is currently looking at. What you could do is that you could then take this, you could make your own version of this, a lookalike version with your own code behind it, You'll host it on your own evil site, and then come down here to this replace hrefs option and change the hrefs on the production version that Jennifer is looking at to point to your evil copy and just you know take it from there. You know your imagination is your own limit in that particular case. But again. And I still kind of hard for Susan. She's not much of a programmer, and uh, you know, that, that's the sort of thing that's just like, you know, she never read too many books to figure out how to do that. So she does a little more Google searching, and she finds that another really handy option that is available here in the is the ability, once you have the other person uh, browser cloaked by running that script, is to one raw JavaScript in the other person's browser. Well, of course, Susan doesn't know too much JavaScript, but she pokes around a little bit and she finds some uh, handy scripts that she can use to cut and paste to do what she wants. And that's exactly what I'm going to do because that's how I got them, too. I'm going to start out with this one right here. I'm going to copy that. I'm going to come back over here. I can't see if there's something that's amiss with the colors here. But we'll just paste in the raw JavaScript. And what this is going to do, execute that, sends it off to the other browser, and a few moments, it will return the contents of that other user's one, two, three, my documents folder. All the folders, all the files will be listed here. Now, in this particular case, of course, that happens to be my my documents folder. So before anybody gets a camera and takes a picture of that, I'm going to move on to the next portion of the time which is we're going to pick one of those uh, files that she saw in that list in my documents folder, which was called sensitive.txt. And she takes another script that she just found on Google, copies it right off. Comes over here, draw JavaScript, paste it in. To, to access, read the sensitive.txt file, execute that. Waits a few moments for the browser to go out, find that file, open it, read it, send the results back, and we see that the contents of it is unlisted file full of stuff that you should not be looking at. <laughs> all right, again, this was all Simple stuff that pretty much anybody can find by going out and looking on, on the internet. Hard, not hard to find these um, vulnerabilities, how to exploit them, even, even like I say, the, uh, the JavaScript necessary to go out and pick up the, you know, my documents files and uh, uh, read files out of it. One of my colleagues at our show was doing uh, actually went back and even came up with some JavaScript files that allowed him you know, to use this same technique to map network drive so that you can go from this application you know, to, to anywhere that 
Jennifer had, had access to. So that brings up the next question. Why was I off looking at this particular application in the first place? Well, it turns out that the original application I was looking at, the real life one, consisted simply of public information. If we were looking at what kind of risk this application was seen to pose to the organization from the good old CAI confidentiality, availability, and integrity viewpoints, when it came to confidentiality, it was seen to be very low risk. It was public information, okay, that information got out or was you know, disseminated to the public, not a problem. In fact, that's, that's what it was supposed to do, it was supposed to be out there in the public. As far as availability, no real, big, no real big deal there either. What they had been doing before they had this web application was just maintaining this on Excel spreadsheets. They called each other up about you know, once every week or two and check and make sure that you know, everybody had the right you know, spreadsheet. If they didn't, well, they could email it to them, no big deal. So loss of availability was considered to be a very low impact issue, very low risk. And as far as integrity, it really only considered, it, it, as you noticed, it uh, contained just people's uh, uh, contact addresses, which in this particular case was not really that, you know, that big a deal. Uh, if they fell out of uh, state, you know, if they got behind, if somebody moved, well, then they, you know, they'd be picked up the next time around. So people really were really worried about the integrity of the data. So in a classic risk assessment of this application, you'd look at this and you would say that the potential effect of loss of confidentiality, availability, or integrity was low across the board. So you know that this is a low risk thing, we'll put it on the, uh, the schedule to be looked at every five or ten years or something of that nature. And I wouldn't have even gone in to look at this application had it not been for the fact that it had gotten listed in the wrong category. It ended up being listed as an application for the Department of Homeland Security. You know, it's the only reason I happen to come across this thing. Because everything under the label of Department of Homeland Security is considered high risk. So I went out there and I looked at this, and I found out that what we actually had here was a, was a low-risk application that could allow a attacker to get in and access anything that was on that person's workstation or any network share that they had access to. This kind of put the lie to our risk assessment process as we were doing it when we were looking at web applications. So, at this point, I don't have any more exploits or threats to show here. It becomes, you know, this just becomes mostly the target tricks kind of stuff. Like I said, there's nothing fancy about doing the text. If you're your grandmother, you can do this stuff if she goes out on Google. The question is, how are we going to incorporate this into our company's risk management strategies? How are we going to look at our applications in such a way such that we are able to identify these sorts of threats in a case where you know Jennifer also did HR stuff you know, on the side or had access to sensitive financial information. You know, this would have clearly been a high risk application. This is the interactive portion of my talk. <laughs> who, who has, has, has anybody felt that they have successfully addressed this issue? And so how? Yes, sir. Well, one thing we did in our risk assessments is any app that has a login automatically bumps up a little bit the risk. And any app that accepts user input and stores it bumps up the risk. And I think both of those you know, are present here. So that would have helped a little bit. I don't know if it still would have gotten high enough to you know, to meet the threshold where it's being looked at, but those are two good questions, I think, 
Okay, the man said that in his company, if an application has both a login or stores user information, that is considered enough to raise the risk, you know, a little bit right there. And sure enough, as we saw, it was the fact that she was able to uh, store scripts, even though that was what it was supposed to store, you know, that, that hurt. Yes, sir. Figuring out which users can actually connect to some of these apps. Who are the tar who are who's your target audience? If it's the engineering department, then it might be because of what else they have access to. I mean, this implies a certain level of maturity in your organization that they may not know what users use which apps, but. Assuming, you know, they're smart enough to say all our engineering guys require two-factor auth because of what they can get to, maybe certain apps like that could be, you know. I, I definitely says identifying potential targets. If you, uh, you know that this application is going to be used by groups who, you know, require a higher security level, like I said, the two-factor auth authorization or tend to be a generally um, higher risk in the base case, that's, uh, that's a good point. Um, one thing that I've noticed if we look at, it, it is kind of buried in there, unfortunately, but if you look in the NIST risk management framework when it comes to risk assessments, there is a portion where it tells you when you go to assess the risk, look, your approach to risk, you can look at one of the things they say, and how you decide to approach the risk is you can look at it from uh, a threat basis. Are you going to consider primarily, you know, here's our threats, you know, what, what could this do? Or our vulnerability centric, which tends to be the way web applications are done. You go out and you, you find cross-site scripting, you find uh, you know, request forgery, things like that in the web app. Side. Okay, what does that mean that you have those vulnerabilities? Or something like what you're talking about here is you take it from an asset-based uh, viewpoint. And I'm thinking that we may be getting close to something there is if we try and look at the uh, effect on our organizations by looking at what, what assets are we trying to protect here. In this particular case, perhaps, had we identified that Jennifer's workstation or the other network uh, data that she had access to was particularly sensitive, then that would be, as he mentioned, anybody who you know, using this application who had access to that would automatically get that up the risk also. Anybody else? Any other thoughts? Yes, sir. This particular exploit began with the cross site scripting exploit. Uh, essentially, if your internal apps meet at least the NOAA's top 10, that's going to keep you from certain very common vulnerabilities. Is that the OWASP? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, definitely. Cutting down, he says, if we eliminate or we minimize the likelihood that there are going to be vulnerabilities in your application, then that's, that's going to cut down the risk. You know, the question about that is that you might just have a likelihood mm -hmm. uh, a successful attack. Um, the issue is that we have here is that a lot of companies, because they only have you know, so many resources to apply to looking at applications, say, okay, there are high risk applications, you know, we're going to attack those first, you know, we're going to review those every six to 12 months or whatever, medium risk applications are going to be looked at every two to three years, and stuff like this, which was basically just Excel spreadsheet, you know, replacement really gets shoved out of the line, and you know, it's a long time before somebody comes around and looks and see just how many vulnerabilities it has. Again, had this application not been mistakenly put in that Department of Homeland Security category, it probably would have been several more years before anybody came by and looked at this thing, or somebody you know hacked into it. And, some of the problems like that we're not here, you know, but that's not the way you want to look at it. That, that's, that's the problem that you have when you're dealing 
with applications that were done by people who were not familiar with the old laws of property, which this one clearly was. Like I said, this application showed every every hallmark I've ever seen of a former Windows web uh, former Windows web form former Windows form developer being asked to write a web app without being in the proper training. Yes, sir. One thing that we all have to remember is that everybody doesn't uh, work cutting edge. Most of our industries that are functioning in this country work on legacy applications that were specifically written to work on certain machines and if you update, patch systems or upgrade, you lose the ability to function. The corporations aren't going to do that. They're, no. not, they're not going to spend the money to rebuild what they've already built once. Yeah, they're, they're, there's a great point that, that addresses the business about eliminating the vulnerabilities is that you know a lot of these things that they try and upgrade them, you know, they're going to break. And you know, they don't want to do that, particularly in a case like this, where they have this application who's Benefit was, you know, just barely enough for the bank to be running in the first place. You know, they're, they're not going to want to spend any money to you know, upgrade it. Uh, but still, once you've got it out there, taking it away from the people who are using it can sometimes be very, very difficult. Now, in this particular case, I will say I did not have that problem. I was able to give this demonstration with the actual application to management. That week, and by the next week, that application was gone. <laughs> so I, I will give them, I will give them credit for that. They looked at that and they said, "Those people can go back to just send the spreadsheets between each other. That's all that they really need." Anybody else? <laughs> that was good. All right. Well, I've never had anybody complain to me about wrapping up early. So we'll take this right here. I want to thank you for being a wonderful audience. I hope you enjoy the rest of the week.